I'm Pat Summerall, your host for Great Teens, Great Years. In the frigid, icy waste of a Wisconsin winter, there once was struck a spark that became an ember, a flame, and then a roaring inferno, and a small town called Green Bay became the hotbed of the NFL. In 61 and 62, the Packers, coached by the intense Vince Lombardi, won back-to-back championships. In 65 and 66, they did it again. Their followers became as zealous as religious postulants, and the legends that surrounded these Packers grew in stature every day. But the stuff of legends is the stuff of the past, and like the empires of Rome, the Incas, and the Aztecs, the Packer dream was soon to fade in shadow. But before the procession of triumphal days drifted downstream, the golden-helmeted Packers made one last glorious stand. They had been so good for so long that every team in the NFL was gunning for them in 1967. But these wise old warriors knew the tricks of the fight. They had absorbed the lessons of football and life handed down by their coach, and they were ready to go at it one more time. We're ready to go for an unprecedented third championship in a row. Since 1965, only one light has burned in the National Football League. It has glowed constantly for the proud Packers of Green Bay, Wisconsin. In Lambeau Stadium on December 31st, 1967, they won their third consecutive NFL title, a feat never before accomplished in the modern history of the game. This is simply about the way it was. Starting with the first championship season, starting with that gloomy December day in 1965, when the Packers met the Colts in Baltimore to determine first place in the Western Division. One man can't win a championship, but certainly no one man contributed more in the crucial games of the 1965 season than Paul Horning, number five. Against the Colts, he scored five touchdowns and led Green Bay to a resounding victory and a half-game lead in the Western Division. But at the season's end, the Colts and the Packers were tied, and in a playoff game in Lambeau Stadium, they battled to a 10-10 deadlock. After 14 minutes of sudden death overtime, Green Bay's dreams of the Western title rode on the right foot of Don Chandler. His field goal attempt cleared the crossbar with ease and cleared the way to the first championship game. One week later, on the same field, Green Bay head coach Vince Lombardi saw Chandler and Horning lead the Packers to the NFL title with a 23-12 victory over the Cleveland Browns. In 1966, quarterback Bart Starr passed Green Bay to an easy victory in the Western Division. In the championship game in the Cotton Bowl, Starr ripped open the Dallas Cowboys with four touchdown passes, and Green Bay won 34-27. Two weeks later, against the Kansas City Chiefs of the AFL, Starr directed the Packers to a convincing triumph in the first Super Bowl game. The second straight championship was won, but the greatest challenge was still to be faced. The stern voice of Coach Lombardi heralded the opening of the 1967 season. This year we face the greatest challenge we have ever faced. We will be in quest of an unprecedented third straight championship, something no team has ever accomplished. Lombardi faced the greatest challenge with a team that was torn and battered. A rugged exhibition schedule had left Bart Starr a mass of bruises, and the Packers' offensive firepower was severely diminished. As a result, Green Bay relied on the strength of its defense to win. 
After an opening day tie with Detroit, the Packers held the Chicago Bears to a total of six first downs and earned their first victory of the year. In the season's third game, the Atlanta Falcons ran 50 plays and gained only 58 yards. Not once did they cross the pack a goal as Green Bay registered a 23-0 shutout. Against the Detroit Lions, the Packard defense did a vicious job, and few will forget the beating Milk Plum received at the hands of Henry Jordan and Willie Davis. And few will forget Ray Nitsky's game-breaking touchdown run with a deflected pass that clinched Green Bay's third victory. So, through the first part of the season, the defense kept Green Bay's title hopes alive. And throughout the remainder of the year, it would be the determining factor in the Packers' success. It is an aggressive defense that intimidates opponents, wears them down, and disorganizes their offensive patterns. work can be judged by the fact that eight of its 11 members have, at one time or another, been honored by selection on various all-pro teams. Supported by this defense, the Packers held up through the first four games without a loss. But with their crippled offense, they were an incomplete team. In fact, rumor had it that the champion Packers were dead. They still wore the same green jerseys and gold helmets, and they still had a concrete defense. But their offense had suffered critical breakdowns. And when they lost to the Minnesota Vikings in the season's fifth game, their future was as much in question as their offense. Division II Men's Basketball Championship next on ESPN. We're all set in Springfield to bring you the live play-by-play. -play. Ladies and gentlemen, the heavyweight champion of the work. Dickie's Work Clothes. It's the best-selling work set in America because it's made of the heaviest, toughest fabric in America, fortified with Fortrell. We don't have to knock out the competition. We wear them out. Dickies. The heavyweight champion of the work. Dickies makes everything in work clothes. But who says you have to work in them? Saturday, ESPN takes you into the action with live USFL football. Two NFL veterans call the signals when Greg Landry leads the Arizona Wranglers against Doug Williams and the Oklahoma Outlaws. Will the Wranglers rope in another victory? Or will the Outlaws ride off with a win? Get the answer live Saturday. During the Suzuki Knockout Savings Sale, you'll see some of our fastest Suzukis move even faster. But hurry, they're already vanishing into thin air. After their loss to the Vikings, the Packers arrived at Yankee Stadium to play the Giants. To Green Bay's proud old veterans, this game had a special significance. Jerry Kramer explains why. We started out rather haphazardly the first few games of the season. And then there was a great attack upon us by the press media that we were all old, that we were over the hill, that the Packers were all old men. And a number of articles about the old Green Bay Packers. They're too old, they're over the hill, over the hump, a number of other things. In New York, against the Giants, Bob Skronsky in his pregame speech got up and said, I'm tired as hell about being called an old man. He says, I'm up to here with it, and I think uh, everyone else on the club was too. We were a little mad, 
not particularly at the Giants, but at the newspaper people more so than anybody else. And we had a little something to prove. They inspired us. They gave us a reason to play. The Packers crushed the Giants 48-21 and proved that all they had lost during the early uncertain days of the season was the use of their quarterback, Bart Starr. Zeke Brettkowski had done a capable job filling in for Starr. He is a good quarterback. But Starr is a great one. And with him back in the lineup, the Packers became a championship team again. They rolled up 400 yards against the Giants and seemed bent on refuting the experts who had predicted the end of the Green Bay dynasty. first half of the season, the defense had kept the Packers in contention. And now in the second half, when it counted most, the offense would carry them to the title. It was Starr who brought on the renaissance of Green Bay's attack. Time and again in crucial third down situations when success was vital to keep scoring drives in progress, Starr demonstrated his celebrated coolness in the face of the enemy. occasion arose, he proved to be an adequate scrambler as well. One reason Starr is such a good quarterback is that he never throws the ball unless he is reasonably sure that he will reach the hands of a teammate. He would accept a momentary setback and patiently wait for the appropriate moment in which to strike. With Star back in shape, the Packer receivers once again enjoyed prosperity. Board Dowler, number 86, the tall ex-hurdler from Colorado, was the Packers' leading receiver with 63 catches. Dowler is tall enough to outreach most defensive backs and fast enough to run by them. 